This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about the Bernstein Sato polynomial. So this lecture will be a bit different from all the others because it's using some slightly non-commutative algebra. Um, the, the point is a lot of the theory of commutative algebra extends to rings that aren't quite commutative. Um, so some examples of these might be exterior algebras. If you take the exterior algebra of a vector space, then this is the property that x times y is sometimes equal to minus y times x instead of being y times x. And you can have algebras that almost commute, for instance a ring of differential operators. Now the ring of differential operators with polynomial coefficients might be generated over the complex numbers, say by x, and also by differentiation with respect to x, so th this gives you a perfectly good ring. However, Leibniz's rule says that d by dx of x is equal to x times d by dx um, uh, plus 1. H here we're thinking of these as being d by dx as being an operator, not, not, not as something acting on x. Um, so here d by dx and x don't quite commute, but they're not far off because the, the amount that they don't commute by is, 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 is just 1. Um, you can also have things like Clifford algebras, as you get in Lie Group's course, where you, have, um, you might have a quadratic form and AB plus BA might be given by, say, the inner product of A and B, if you've got some sort of inner product on a vector space. So all of these have the property that AB is closely related to BA. Roughly speaking, AB is equal to BA or minus BA um, plus something simpler, whatever simpler means. For instance, here d by dx and x commute up to, up to a constant, and a constant is obviously simpler than x or d by dx. And if you've got any algebra where, which is sort of close to being commutative in this sense, then you can quite often apply the techniques of, of um, commutative algebra to it. And I'm going to give an application of this where we're going to use the ring of differential operators in order to um, show the existence of something called the Bernstein or Bernstein Sato polynomial. Um, by the way, if you look up Bernstein polynomial, it actually turns out there are two totally unrelated things called the Bernstein polynomial. There's a sort of Bernstein polynomial used a bit in numerical analysis, and it's absolutely nothing to do with this Bernstein polynomial. They're named after different Bernsteins. This is Joe Bernstein. Um, so uh, let, let, let's explain what the Bernstein polynomial is by, by looking at the gamma function. So, as everybody knows, the gamma function, gamma of s, is the integral 0 to infinity of e to minus t, t to the s minus 1 dt. So this converges for the real part of s greater than 0. And if the real part of s is equal to 0, then this bit diverges near 0. However, you can analytically continue the gamma function by integrating by parts. Um, so what you do is you find that gamma of s is equal to 1 over s, gamma s plus 1. And what you do is you um, differentiate this bit and you integrate this bit in your integration by parts. And if you do that, you find this relation between gamma of s and gamma of s plus 1. And this can be used to extend gamma s to all complex s, um, possibly with poles. Because in order to extend it to s less than 1, you see you have to divide it by s. 
and that divides it to the extends it to the real part of s being greater than minus one and then when you extend its real part of s being greater than minus two you might get a, another um, pole somewhere else. So you can extend it as a meromorphic function and let's see what the, 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 the key point why you can extend it is is because this bit here is is um, um, ha has the following property. We notice that d by dt of t um, to the s plus 1 is equal to s plus 1 t to the s. And this means you can sort of integrate t to the s and convert it into a t to the s plus 1 when you're integrating by parts. So now we, we, we come across the Bernstein-Sato polynomial. Um, B of s. Um, here f is a polynomial in several variables x1 up to xn. And suppose we can find a differential operator such that p of s f of x to the s plus 1 is equal to b of s times f of x to the s. So this is some sort of differential operator in um, x1 up to xn, d by dx1 up to d by dxn and s. And this is going to be a polynomial in s. And if you can do this, then you can extend the integral over r to the n of phi of x times f of x to the s dx, provided, let's suppose f is always greater than or equal to naught, and this might be some nice function. Say so it might be smooth, uh, maybe vanishing at infinity, compact support, say. Um, now, if you look back at this, you'll notice that e to the minus t is not smooth because um, we were only integrating from naught, so it's got a discontinuity at naught, and it's, and, it's, and, it, and it's not compact support either, but that doesn't really matter because these conditions are actually rather strong than we need. Um, the, uh, it, 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 if phi is smooth and of compact support, then, then you can write down this integral, but you can quite often do it even if phi is a, is a little bit more complicated. Anyway, if you do this, this might converge for, for s greater than or equal to zero, so obviously because this is perfectly nice for s greater than or equal to zero, and then by integrating by parts using this formula here, so you're going to um, um, integrate by parts in a rather complicated way using this differential operator, you can extend to all complex values of s, except as before you'll pick up poles, um, and you'll pick up poles at the zeros, uh, at zeros that have something to do with the zeros of, of, of this Sato, Bernstein-Sato polynomial. So, um, so, for example, um, in, in this particular case, if you just take f of s equal um, t, then we will find b of s might be equal to s plus 1, say. So that's a very simple example. Let's look at a slightly more complicated example in several variables. So let's take f of x1 up to xn to be x1 squared plus, plus all the way up to xn squared. Um, and now you want to find some polynomial so you want to find some differential operator which takes x1 squared plus xn squared to the s plus 1 um, to be something times x1 squared plus xn squared to the s. So you want to fill in the missing bit here and the missing bit here. Well that's not too difficult to do because you can take d by dx1 squared plus plus d by dxn squared. So you can take the Laplace operator here and if you apply the Laplace operator to this then you find what we get here is 4s plus 1 s plus n over 2 times that. So, so here we find b of s is equal to s plus 1 um, s plus n over 2 and p of s would be say a quarter of sum of d by dxi squared. 
So you might want to normalize the, the, the Bernstein Sato polynomial so that the leading coefficient is one. And you, you actually notice if you go back here, um, the possible polynomials you can get here actually form an ideal. So you actually define the Bernstein Sato polynomial to be a generous generator of that ideal with, with leading coefficient one, and that identifies it uniquely. Um, but I mean, once you've shown that the, the problem is to prove that some polynomial like that exists. Once you've proven that some polynomial like that exists, then then that's generally all you need. Um, the, the, the Bernstein polynomial, Bernstein Sato polynomial, is actually rather difficult to work out in general. For example, let's take f of x, um, y to be x squared plus y cubed. So it's only slightly more complicated than x squared plus y squared. Well, in this case, it's really rather hard to calculate the, the, the Bernstein Sato polynomial. I, I'll give you the answer. So the answer is it's Bernstein Sato polynomial is s plus 1 times s plus 5 sixths times s plus 7 sixths. So you see already that's getting fairly complicated. And if you if you try and work it out or even check it, you find you're getting having to deal with mountains of linear algebra. Um, of course, there are lots of computer algebra systems these days that will compute the, the Bernstein Sato polynomial for you, but it's it's really not at all trivial to compute, even in quite easy examples like this. Um, so um, the main theorem proved by Bernstein and Sato is the following theorem. Every polynomial, every non-zero complex polynomial, um, F, has a Bernstein Sato polynomial. So that just means that it, so there's some differential operator satisfying this equation here with b of s not being identically zero. Um, well, I'm going to explain how to prove this using ideas from commutative algebra in the next couple of lectures. But what I'll do for this lecture is just um, show you that the bernstein sato polynomial is really quite powerful by but by, by giving an application of it. So, so here's a, a, an easy corollary of the um, existence of a Bernstein Sato polynomial. Um, the corollary is the Malgrange um, Aaron Price theorem. This says that every um, differential operator with constant coefficients has a fundamental solution. Um, so let's think what this means. Well, a differential operator might be called D, and what you need is a fundamental solution um, 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 F, so that D of F is a, di a Dirac delta function. Um, of course, the Dirac delta function is not really a function, it's really a distribution. So, um, so here D is a differential operator in, in several variables. And um, if you can find um, a fundamental solution of the differential operator, then you can solve the equation df equals g for any reasonable function g by, by sort of convoluting. You, you sort of informally you, you write g as a sort of linear combination of delta functions, so it's, it's really a sort of infinite continuous linear combination. So if you can find a fundamental solution, then you can pretty much solve um, the, the, this differential equation for, for any function g here. So, so for a long time it was an, a, a major open question in the theory of linear differential equations to show that any differential equation had a fundamental solution. And this was finally proved by Malgrange and Aaron Price. And at the time it was considered this really big, difficult theorem. Um, well, um, 
to show you how powerful the bernstein sato polynomial is, we will just show that this follows almost trivially from its existence. So the problem, we want to solve df is the delta function. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take Fourier transforms. So um, if we take Fourier transforms in several variables, the Fourier transform converts um, differentiation into multiplication by, by x. So, so it will convert any differential operator with, with constant coefficients into a polynomial q. And it will convert f into some Fourier transform of f. And it will convert the Dirac delta function into the function 1. So what we're trying to solve is this equation here. Here this is a polynomial and f is some, some distribution and this is the constant 1. And now you look at this and you think, well, this is perfectly trivial to solve. Let's try a solution. Let's try f hat equals 1 over q. What's wrong with that? Looks like a completely trivial thing to solve. Well, this is, um, if q is non-zero e everywhere, then this gives a perfectly good solution because 1 over q is a perfectly good function. The problem is, what if q has zeros? And the problem is, if q has zeros, so near q of x equals 0, 1 over q is not locally integrable. And if it's not locally integrable, then it's not at all clear how to make it into a distribution in general. Now, if the zeros of q are fairly simple, for instance, if q has a simple zero that's just a non-singular variety, then it's very easy to make 1 over q into a distribution. And you can even do this with more complicated things. For instance, if the zeros are several nice smooth varieties meeting transversely, so we say the singularities have normal crossings, then again it's very easy to, to make sense of this as a distribution. The problem is the zeros of q might be some very complicated singularity, for instance, if, if we're thinking of a function of two variables, we might have a singularity y cubed equals x to the 4 or something. And it's not immediately obvious what you, how to um, turn this into a distribution. And in high dimensions, things get even more complicated. Well, there's one way to solve this by using a really big sledgehammer, which is... You quote Hironaka's theorem about resolution of singularities in high dimensions. And what Hironaka's theorem says roughly is if you've got any singularity in high dimensions, you can do this magical blow up operation and turn it into a singularity with normal crossings. And then you can then you can um, find a distribution one over Q. But I mean, you know, Hironaka's theorem was you know, one of the most hardest theorems in mathematics when it came out. And although it's been simplified a lot, it's still pretty hard going. I mean, I've I've seen claims that you can present it in the last couple of weeks of a graduate course, and I'm sure you can present it in the last couple of weeks of a graduate course, but how many of the graduates will actually follow your presentation is not at all clear to me. Anyway, so one way of doing it of solving this problem is, is by using Hironaka's theorem. Well, we don't want to do that because that's that's really a lot of work. It's much easier to use um, the, the, the Bernstein-Sato polynomial. So, so we can assume q is greater than or equal to zero everywhere, and that's very easy because 1 over q is just equal to the complex conjugate of q over q times q bar, and this bit here is greater than or equal to zero. So if we can invert um, polynomials that are always non-negative, then we can do all of them. And now we notice that q to the s is holomorphic for the real part of s greater than or equal to zero. Absolutely no problem. We think of this as being a holomorphic as a distribution. Now, using the Bernstein-Sato polynomial, we can continue 
qs as a meromorphic function of s to all s in c. Now when I say it's a meromorphic function you have to be a little bit careful because it's actually a function taking values not in complex numbers but in distributions. So what this means is that if we've got any nice function, say smooth compact support, then um, if we take the integral of phi with q over dx to the n, this is going to be meromorphic in S for any nice function phi. So um, it's, it's not a meromorphic complex valued function, it's something a little bit more complicated, but it's 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 not really much more complicated. You 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 just bang it against a test function, and then you get a meromorphic complex-valued function. Um, so um, it has poles um, um, related to zeros of B of S plus N, where. Um, S is the bernstein sato polynomial, so it might, 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 have, might have complicated poles all over the place. Um, now what we want to do is we want to define q to the minus 1. Well, um, q to the s might have a pole at s equals minus 1. If it didn't have a pole, then, then we'd be done. We, we, we could define q to the minus 1 nicely. Well, um, Let's expand it as a Laurent series. So we might have q to the s minus 1 equals q minus m s to the minus m plus q to the 1 minus m s to the 1 minus m plus plus q naught s to the naught and so on. So this is just a Laurent series and the coefficients q um, something or other are, they're of course not complex numbers, they're, they're, they're going to be distributions. So um, they become complex numbers if you, if you bang them against some sort of test function. Now let's multiply by q. So we find q to the s is equal to q times q to the minus m s to the minus m and so on, plus q times q naught s to the naught and so on. On the other hand, we know q to the s is, is holomorphic at s equals 0. In, in, in fact, at s equals 0, it's just 1. So, so this is equal to 1 plus something or other, and all these terms here are 0. So we find q, q minus m equals 0, up to q, q minus 1 equals 0, and q, q 0 equals 1. So q 0 is an inverse of q and we can use q0 to, to, to um, find a fundamental solution to our differential operator. In fact we just take the, the this will be a, a distribution and we just take its Fourier transform q0 twiddle is going to be the fundamental solution. Um, well there's actually a, a you, you might think there's a slight problem here because um, we notice that q times q minus m equals 0 all the way up to q times q minus 1 equals 0. So there are many inverses of q because we can take q0 plus a linear combination of q minus m up to q minus 1. And in fact, generally there'll be lots of other stuff as well. And this seems to be a bit of a problem because an element of a ring has at most one inverse. Um, because if, if we've got a ring Q and we've got two inverses, so QA equals 1 and QB equals 1, then we can say BA, so BQ, start again, B. QA is equal to A because B times Q is equal to 1 and it's also equal to B. So what on earth am I going on about claiming that I can find lots of inverses of this polynomial Q? Well, um, first answer to that is that the 
product of distributions is not always defined. Um, so distributions don't actually form a ring. You can quite often multiply distributions. In fact, you can, you can always multiply distributions by smooth functions, for example. And you think about it a bit and you say, well, the fact that product of distributions is not always well defined doesn't actually affect this because um, here Q is a smooth function. All we're ever doing in this equation is multiplying a smooth function by a distribution. So here we take a smooth function times a distribution, we get one, and we then multiply that by another distribution. So although the product of distributions is not always defined, this isn't actually what the problem here is. The second problem is that when the product is defined, it need not be associative. And this is, this is the real reason why we don't get a contradiction. And I want to emphasize that because everybody knows products of distributions aren't defined, but not so many people are aware that, that the product isn't associative when it is defined. Let me give a really simple example of a product of distributions not being associative. So let me take the distributions x and I'm going to take 1 over x and I'm going to make this into a distribution. And OK, um, this is not locally integrable, but it's such a nice function. It's not very difficult to make it into a distribution. You can sort of take a, a Cauchy principal value or something and make that into a distribution. And then I'm going to put here, I'm going to put the Dirac delta function. And then we know that x times delta equals zero. And here we're multiplying a smooth function by a distribution, so there's no problem. But 1 over x times what times x is equal to 1. So you see that if we take 1 over x times x times delta this way, this is equal to delta. Whereas 1 over x times x times delta, well, here we've got x times delta, which is 0. So, so this is just 0. So even for very easy distributions in one variable, where you're just multiplying distributions by smooth functions, the, the, the product is still not associative. Um, OK, uh, so um, what we'll be doing in the next couple of lectures is using commutative algebra, in particular the Hilbert polynomial, to prove the existence of Bernstein polynomials.